the five periods of the Buddha's teaching. The Dharma spoken by the Buddhas was divided into five periods and eight teachings by the great master Chu Yu, the wise one. 538-597 AD. The five periods will be categorized by means of the two kinds of wisdom, expedient and actual. One, the Avatams of Kaparit represented in the world by the Avatam Saka Sutra consists in the Dharma spoken by the Buddha during the first 21 days of his teaching. The period includes one kind of Vespadian Dharma and one kind of actual Dharma, the gradual and the sudden. That is, the Avatam Saka Sutra teaches one kind of Vespadian wisdom and one kind of actual wisdom. The Avatam Saka Sutra explains the doctrine of the Dharma realms, the Dharma realm of phenomena, the nominal Dharma realm, the Dharma realm in which phenomena are unobstructed, the Dharma realm in which nominal is unobstructed, and the Dharma realm in which both phenomena and nominal are unobstructed. Although this teaching was spoken for the sake of Bodhisattvas, the Avadam Saka Sutra nonetheless contains one kind of expedient Dharma, along with the actual wisdom, that is, along with the real Buddha Dharma. Two, in the second or Agama period, the Buddha spoke no actual Dharma or actual wisdom, but instead spoke an expedient Dharma. That at that time, all sentient beings were like children, and since they did not understand the Buddha Dharma, the Buddha used various Tibetan Dharma doors to induce and guide them, to transform them, and to take them across. 3. During the third period, the Vaipulya, the Buddha spoke three kinds of Tibetan Dharma and one kind of actual Dharma. At that time, the four teachings were explained together. The Treasury Tripitaka teaching of the Hinayana, the Connecting teaching, and the Special teaching, which are the three Spedan Dharmas, and the Perfect teaching, which is actual Dharma, revive the one sided and upbraid the small, indicates that the one sidedness of the small vehicle. The Hinayana is wrong. Praise the great and extol the perfect. Commence the perfect teaching of the great vehicle, the Mahayana. In the Vaipulya period, the four teachings were explained together. For the fourth, te- no, the fourth period is the Prana period. In it, there were two kinds of expedient Dharma, the connecting and special teachings and one kind of actual dharma, the perfect teaching. 5. In the lotus nirvana period, which includes the wonderful Dharma Lotus Flower Sutra and the Mahaparinivana uh, Sutra, there was no expanding dharma, there was only actual dharma and actual wisdom. To summarize the five periods in the lotus nirvana period, only actual dharma appears there is no expanding Dharma in the Prana period, two expanding Dharmas and one actual Dharma appear. In the Vaipulya period, three expanding and one actual Dharma appear. In the Agama period, there is only expanding and no actual Dharma. And in the Avadamsaka period, there is one expanding and one actual, the gradual and the sudden. Here, both explanation implies the two types of wisdom, expedient and actual. So, we'll categorize the five periods. If the periods were explained in detail, there would be much, much more to say. So, in lecturing on the sutras, I explain a little more each time. I tell you a little more of what you haven't heard. Listen a lot, and you will understand a lot. The meaning of sutra. Sutras have both a generic and a specific title. The generic title is simply sutra, while the specific title distinguishes one sutra from another. The heart of prana paramita sutra 
is the specific title of this sutra. Brana Paramita is the Dharma. Heart is the analogy. Sutra is the sutra. The heart of Brana Paramita is the heart within the heart. No other sutra in the Prana division has this name. I have already explained the specific title, the heart of Prana Paramita, by an eight line verse. Now the word sutra will be fully explained. What is sutra? A sutra is defined as path, the path necessarily passed through in cultivation of the way. If you wish to cultivate, you must move along that path. If you don't want to cultivate, following it is necessary. But if you do want to cultivate, sutra is a path you must take. Now, if people don't walk on a path, it becomes wide and overgrown with vegetation. For example, you may have been able to recite the heart of Prana Paramita Sutra without it referring to a text, but then four or five months pass without your reciting it and you forget it. That forgetting is a path becoming overgrown. However, if you walk the path, if you cultivate the way, then it won't become overgrown, but every day will become smoother and brighter. What is the benefit of reciting sutras? Reciting sutras doesn't yield any benefits. You waste a lot of time and use a lot of energy to recite a sutra. For instance, what is gained by reciting the Heart Sutra in front of the Buddha? You read it from beginning to end, waste energy, spirit and time, but don't see any return from it. Ah, uh, cultivators, don't be so stupid. The benefits which you can see are not real. All appearances are empty and false. To grasp at a form at what you can see is not a benefit. That is why reciting sutras isn't beneficial. Don't search for benefits. Recite the sutra once and your own nature is cleaned once. When you recite the heart sutra once, you have the feeling that you understand a little of its meaning. Recite it twice or three times, and each time you understand a little more. Reciting sutras helps the wisdom of your own nature to grow. How much you can see, nevertheless, you can have a kind of feeling about it. Therefore, it is not possible to talk about the benefits of reciting sutras. Moreover, each time you recite the sutra, your afflictions decrease. You shouldn't get upset during recitation by thinking, You over there, you recited it wrong. You recited it too fast. I can't keep up, keep up with you. The sounds that you make when you recite are really unpleasant, so I don't like to listen to it. No, don't waste your effort in those directions. When reciting sutras or mantras, everyone should chant together. It isn't necessary for everyone to know the language the sutra is being recited in, but able to read the sutra or not, everyone should recite along together. For everyone to practice together, though, doesn't mean you're looking for my phones and my looking for your phones. If they're really phones, everyone should find them, and if you yourself don't find your own phones, because they are too big, then your cultivation will not be attuned to receive a response. Reciting sutras is a great help to one's own nature in developing wisdom. Reciting the Diamond Sutra develops wisdom. Reciting the Heart Sutra develops even more wisdom. You say that there aren't any benefits gained from reciting sutras, yet the benefits are very good. It's just that you don't see them. You don't see them, then they're real benefits. Anything that you can see is just the skin. The word sutra has four other meanings. That which swings together, that which attracts, that which is permanent, and a method. Stringing together refers to the connecting of all the meanings which were spoken to make a sutra as if a piece of thread were used to string them together. A sutra attracts it in that it can make use of opportunities for the transformation of sentient beings. 
this particular sutra is capable of responding to the casual opportunities of all sentient beings and of giving each a medicine to cure that being the own particular disease. Just as a strong magnet can attract iron from a great distance, a sutra like a magnet draws in all sentient beings. These sentient beings are like iron, hard and stubborn, with large tempers and many folds. But as soon as we are pulled into the magnet, we begin to be slowly softened so that our folds fall away. That is the meaning of that which attracts. The sutra is permanent because it is eternally unchanging dharma and has neither beginning nor end. Not one word can be omitted from or added to a sutra, thus it is eternal. An ancient time and in the present living beings have cultivated and will continue to cultivate according to this sutra. A sutra is a method followed in cultivation of the way in the three builders of time, past, present, and future, one cultivates according to this dharma. What is honored in the three builders of time alike is called the method. What is unchanging in the past and present is called the permanent. Sutra also has the meaning of a marking line. In ancient China, carpenters used a tool called the ink cup and line. It consists of a string which was inked black when the carpenters want to be sure that their construction was straight and true. They would stretch the string out, pull it back and snap it to in order to make a straight black guideline. To sum up, a sutra is a set of rules. To recite sutras is to follow the rules. If you don't recite sutras, then you don't follow the rules. Since you are now studying prana, you certainly should respect the rules of prana. If you do, you will certainly develop your wisdom. I have spoken in general about the title of the sutra, and now I will talk about the translator. For everything we understand of this sutra, we should give great thanks to the translator. If we had never existed, we should be unable to see the sutra or even to hear its name. If that were the case, how would we be able to cultivate according to the methods prescribed in it? It would be impossible to find its path of cultivation. Therefore, we should thank the person who translated the sutra, since from that time up to the present moment, every generation has benefited from his compassionate teaching and transforming. It follows that the merit derived from translating sutras is inconceivably great. The translator. The text says that the heart of Prana Paramita Sutra was translated by Tang Dhamma Master of the Chipitaka Swan Tsang on imperial command. Tang refers to the Tang Dynasty of China 618-907 AD. Chibitaka is Sanskrit for three storehouses, the three storehouses of the Buddhist canon. They are the sutras which teach samadhi, single-minded concentration, the vinaya, which contains the precepts or rules of moral conduct, and the sastras, which contain discussion of doctrine. A Dharma master is one who takes the Buddha Dharma as his master and also one who uses the Buddha Dharma to teach and transform living beings. This Dharma master, Swan Sang, took the Dharma as his master and he also used it to transform sentient beings. He was perfect on both counts, so either way, to use the title Dharma master, it applies to him. Dharma master Swan Sang roots were especially deep, thick, and wonderful. The state of his existence was inconceivable. From his own time up to the present, he is Buddhism's greatest Dharma master. One might ask, how can you say that he is the greatest? When he went to India during the Tang dynasty, 
to bring back the text of sutras to China, the great modern transportation transportation network of buses, planes, boats, and trains did not exist. What did Dharma Master Xuan Zhang use for transportation? He went from China to Siberia across the Himalayas to India on horseback. Such a journey is extremely long and involves much suffering for no others had made the trip before him. Even though so, there were no mountains where he lived, Tang Master Xuan Zhang, before he left to bring back the sutras, practiced running and mountain climbing every day. How did he do it? He piled up a lot of chairs and tables and jumped from one to the next, from table to chair, back and forth, by practicing at home before undertaking the extremely long journey. He was able to attain his aim and reach India. He lived there for 14 years and collected many sutras which he brought back to China. When he returned from India, he received an imperial command to translate the sutras into Chinese from their original language of India. Now it is up to you Westerners to translate the sutras into the language of the West. The merit derived by the people who take part in this work will be without limit, for it will benefit not only their own lives, but will be cause for the gratitude of generations of people in the West. Everyone can be included in the work of translation. No one should fall behind in learning Chinese. Jew Westerners should make an offering to the people of the West.